So, one more time, covering the ground that we have covered thus far. On Peter's channel, I was invited on his channel to defend my Christian beliefs. I have zero qualms about how I was treated. We got a little heated at the beginning, a little heated at the end, no big deal in my book. Um, but, in the middle, we started to have a real conversation about where I was starting to present the core of what I think is a powerfully game-changing argument. <laughs> you say, provide evidence for the existence of God. I think I am building a syllogism that is powerfully convincing. I really honestly do. So let's examine the premises of that syllogism. Premise one. See, what I'm trying to do is keep the premises that we all agree upon, or we all obviously see as true. Instead of shooting for the moon and trying to, you know, prove to you the unprovable, I will stick to the facts. What did you call them? I called them the facts. What are they called? The facts. And examine those. And see if we can't come to a fair-minded, reasonable conclusion that pff, Craig is dealing in some form of truth and he isn't so far out from reality that we can't recognize that he is dealing in something that is at least has some relationship to the truth. So let's start with premise one. The Bible is a book of stories. No arguments from anybody, except for the one insane person over there. No, it's a spaceship that takes you to the moon. Okay, that guy's arguing. <laughs> He's crazy. That's it. No arguments to the contrary. The Bible is a book of stories, so we all agree. Okay, premise number two. The Bible is a book of stories that contains powerful metaphorical and wisdom truths. Now we can start to get some... some some disagreement in the in the discussion with Peter and uh, what's his name? What's your name? Reed. Reed. <laughs> Robert Reed. I was going to say Renee. You reminded me of Renee. Reed. Um, in the discussion with Reed and Peter, there was some disagreement. Now I only brought up two examples, and those are off the top of my head. Those are examples that are going to be in my videos that I've either posted or or made but haven't posted yet, I forget. Um, uh, at this point I got a backlog of videos and I don't know what the logic is behind when I post them and when I don't. Um, yeah, okay, <laughs> so we're clear. I got a, whole, got a whole backlog of videos and I post some of them and I'm not sure what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so as long as we're clear about that. Um, premise one. The Bible, oh no, we, we already agreed on premise one. We're on premise two now. Premise two, the Bible is a book of stories that contains profound metaphorical or wisdom truths. Now, the two I brought up in the moment, we had some dispute about. I brought up one thing, the greatest amongst you shall be the servant of all. To me, that's a principle of servant leadership. To me, that's axiomatic and completely and obviously true. But there was disagreement about that premise. Um, what, what did Peter say? Peter said, Peter had a whole thing that that's not necessarily how you want to approach leadership because he was a business owner himself and Reed said it didn't go deep enough. It was just kind of a slogan and it was good advice, but good advice isn't powerful wisdom. Okay, fair enough. Relatively okay counter arguments. So then I brought up, you know, uh, an admonition in Matthew against hypocrisy. Before you take the beam out of your neighbor's eye, take the beam out of your own eye, you hypocrite. And again, we had some contention. Uh, both of them seem to think that doesn't go deep enough to qualify as a as a wisdom truth. Both of them seem to think that that doesn't qualify to go deep enough as a wisdom truth. Um, again, fair enough. I'm not married to those particular two passages as the wisdom truths of the Bible or the profound metaphorical truths of the Bible. I can do that a hundred times with other things. Eventually... Over the course of maybe a year, I will, if I keep going back and we keep just discussing premise two, eventually they're both going to agree with me. And they kind of almost started to agree with me anyways. Keep in mind the premise is very simple. The Bible is a book of stories that contains profound metaphorical or wisdom truths in it. To me, it's pretty axiomatic. It's pretty inarguable. Whether those two particular things that I talked about just off the top of my head embody that completely, I don't know. I guess it's debatable. It doesn't really matter. Because the premise is pretty obvious, and if I keep going back and I keep just sticking to that premise, eventually both of them are going to agree. Why? Because it's true. It's in essence true. Now, here's just a question for you to think about. 
The Bible was written, we all agree, the Bible was written by ignorant, goat herding, hillbilly, Bronze Age guys with no scientific understanding whatsoever. Couldn't even build a train. They couldn't even build a train. That's how dumb, that's how backwards these people were. They didn't even, they, you're like, why are they walking across the desert? Why didn't they just take a train? Because they didn't know how to build one. <laughs> they didn't have a combustion engine. That's why they didn't take a train. So they couldn't even build one. That's how ignorant we're talking about. Why look to these backwards imbeciles to tell us anything about how to live our life? Because they nailed a couple of essential wisdom symbolic truths. That's why. That's why 2,000 years after the fact, we are still debating and discussing the insights that they put on the printed page. Why? Because they nailed some essential, I would argue to say, obviously transcendental truths. Why transcendental? Because we're discussing it 2,000 years after the fact, and I'm telling you that those are still capital T true. Which means in some way or another, they speak through time. They are forever true, forever and always true. How did they do it? Remember, these are ignorant goat herders. They couldn't even build a train. Couldn't even build a train. Couldn't even come up with a good tweet. Why? Because they didn't have Twitter. That's how backwards this is. They didn't even have Twitter back then. Yeah. I don't know what they did either. But they didn't tweet. <laughs> I have no idea what they did, but they didn't tweet. So how'd they do it? That's just a question. That's not an argument. It's just a question worth thinking about. What is the source of inspiration? Now, let's go to premise number three, which I threw out there, but so far has remained unaddressed. You know, it's just a time thing. I don't, I'm not saying they dodged it. It's just I threw it out there, but we didn't really talk about it. In Jordan Peterson's debate with Sam Harris, which I strongly suggest all of you start watching, all three of them, because they're, they're really, really good, and you'll see where apologetics is actually going, and you'll see with your own two eyes What's, what's, what is coming in terms of the quality of the Christian arguments? So, premise number three. Oftentimes a powerfully creative person, a la a William Shakespeare, will describe themselves as a conduit through which divine energy pours. Now, are you starting to see the wisdom of my methodology? Because it should be pretty obvious. Hundred times a day, an atheist will tell me extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. What do you say? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So I come to you and I say, Jesus rose from the dead. You say, why, Craig, that's extraordinary claim. And then you say, do you have any extraordinary proof? Now i got to come up with a miracle or you're not going to believe me. So, I shifted to something not all that extraordinary. Oftentimes... A powerfully creative person, a la William Shakespeare, will describe themselves as a conduit through which the divine energy flows. That is not an extraordinary claim. That's a common claim. Like I said, often. Matter of fact, that's such a common claim that I remember seeing powerfully creative people describe themselves as that long before I became a Christian. And that's one of the reasons why I started to become intellectually convinced that there was a God. Because I saw that particular claim so frequently. It is so common to the creative experience. It is common to the creative experience. You say, so what? It doesn't prove anything. I didn't say it did prove anything. Just saying it's an interesting thing to start wrapping your brain around, huh? For example, let's take Arthur Miller, wrote Death of a Salesman. I remember reading this, 26, 27 years old, starting to become intellectually convinced that there was a God, and this was evidence in that favor. I remember him describing the, the writing of Death of a Salesman. He locked himself in a room, a cabin in the woods, and he said for a period of about a week or two weeks, he felt like just divine light was shooting through him, and he wrote the whole thing, bang, right on the spot. Again, common claim, not extraordinary claim. Common claim, a claim that is mirrored in other faiths. Zen, they call it the flow. Other faiths talk about stuff like this all the time. The very word inspiration means the breath of God. That's the etymology of the word itself. So at least you got to admit this. The source of creativity is at least mysterious. At least mysterious. If that mystery doesn't point to divinity, you're not ready to accept that. You know, that's fine. We've got plenty of time. <laughs> We've got plenty of time to work on this. So that's all for now. Uh, it was a good conversation. Like I said, I have no problems with how I was treated on Peter's channel. It was substance and conversation for the most part. It was, it was fair and it was kind of fun. So there you go.
That's all for now. Amen.